Today's reading is taken from Mark 12, verses 12 to 31. On the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice a Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely not I. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many he said to them I tell you the truth I will not drink again of the fruit fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God when they had sung a hymn they went out to the Mount of Olives you will all fall away Jesus told them for it is written I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. I will tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Today, yes, tonight before the cock crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. This is the word of the Lord. 13 years ago in 2008, I joined Facebook. I uh, don't post as much on it now as I used to, mostly because um, I'm not really sure that I actually know all the people who are on my friends list. But over 13 years, it has recorded a lot of what I've done and where I've been. And so because for a number of years now I've spent the last bit of January and the first bit of February in Israel-Palestine, I've seen a lot of photos over the last few days that I've taken in previous years. Uh, here's a selfie from a year and a few days ago. I'd uh, arrived in Tel Aviv that afternoon, taken the train to Jerusalem and then the light rail, and uh, here I am in the freezing cold at Christchurch Guesthouse in the old city. And although I'm obviously sorry that I'm not there right now, as I probably would be if it were not for the pandemic, I'm grateful for these memories prompted by Facebook. And it's made me realise anew how recalling the past affects the present. So, for example, a small example, after I'd taken this selfie, I went off in search for some falafel and I ended up having a chat with a guy in the courtyard down below who told me something about the way he studies the Bible. I, I won't go into the details of that right now, but I had completely forgotten about that conversation until I saw this photo uh, pop up on my Facebook a few days ago. And I tried his method on Mark chapter 14 and it's really helpful. A much more weighty example of how remembering the past has an impact on the present 
could be seen in the way that uh, a number of Jewish leaders last Wednesday on Holocaust Memorial Day spoke out about what is happening right now to the Uyghur population in China's Xinjiang province. Memories of the past, even if they are memories which are passed down, belong in the present too, to help to form the present and to shape it. And this is of course true of the memory of the Last Supper, which Alison has read for us today from Mark's Gospel. Because this is the basis for the communion service, which is an act of remembering. When Luke writes about it in his Gospel, and when the Apostle Paul writes about it in the first letter to the Corinthians, they both tell us that when Jesus gave the disciples the bread, he told them to do this in remembrance of me. And I guess what we do if we were living in normal times is that we'd make sure that if this was our Bible passage in a service, then we'd make sure that it was a communion service. Seems a bit daft to read the bit where Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper and then not share in the Lord's Supper. But of course, uh, today we can't share in the Lord's Supper because we can't meet. We can't celebrate communion together. Nevertheless, we need to find a way to remember what Mark is telling us about here and to find a way to let it settle into us. Even if we can't do that by breaking and eating bread together, and by drinking wine. Well, what are we remembering? Two big aspects in the main. The first big aspect is a great rescuing act of God. We are remembering a great rescuing act of God. This was a Passover meal, wasn't it? Uh, Which Jesus was sharing with his disciples. Verse 16, the disciples left, went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. Even so, some people say it can't have been a Passover meal because if you look in John's Gospel, Jesus is put to death on the day of preparation for the Passover. So how can he already have eaten the Passover with his disciples if he was nailed to a cross uh, as uh, the Passover was being prepared? This doesn't trouble me at all, and I think the answer lies in different people using different calendars. Uh, There are other possible explanations as well. But it seems a bit of a stretch to say that Mark, who calls this a Passover meal, four times, must have got this wrong. What was the Passover? Well, uh, it was, of course, the celebration of the great event in Israelite history, the towering story of the Old Testament, the heart of the Jewish faith in the first century and today. The Passover remembered how God took his people who were slaves in Egypt centuries before and rescued them, brought them out of slavery and brought them into freedom. The point of the Passover is that you looked back to that event with grateful hearts. And if you take part in a Jewish Passover Seder today, what you find is that the elements of the meal are used to recall that great rescuing act of God. Salty water to remember the tears of suffering in slavery. Bitter herbs because Pharaoh embittered the lives of the Hebrew ancestors. A uh, a fruit puree made to look like the mud and clay bricks that Pharaoh forced them to make. Precisely how much of a modern Seder you would have seen at a first century one is a matter of debate. 
Undoubtedly, there have been additions over the years. But there's good reason to think that this basic idea was indeed part of it. You remembered the story of the great rescuing act of God using items of food which were on the table, combining things which we so easily tend to separate, eating, worship, fellowship, remembrance, instruction. So uh, what does Jesus do at this Passover meal? Verse 22, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take it, this is my body. Verse 23, then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Now, look, if a bloke says that sort of thing at an ordinary meal, you're going to be forgiven if you wonder for a moment whether he is in full possession of his marbles. But say it at a dinner when what you do is you give meaning to the elements of the meal, then you do actually have something very significant being said. And say it at a dinner when what you do is give meaning to the elements of a meal in terms of God's redemption and salvation, then you have something new being said about redemption and salvation. That the body and blood of Jesus is being given and being poured for the purposes of rescue as an act to seal the covenant, the relationship between humanity and God. The scandal of this, of course, is that Jesus is not looking back, as you're supposed to do at the Passover. He's getting people to look at him. I am, he says, the great rescuing act of God. So one big aspect is that we are remembering a great rescuing act of God which Jesus is reframing. So the second big aspect is that we are remembering that that act of God's rescue is the death of Jesus. The Passover may have been about rescue but wasn't it also about death on the other side of the coin, so to speak? Uh, you can read about it in the book of Exodus in the Bible, in chapter 12. If you did not paint the blood of the sacrificial lamb on your door frames on that night of rescue, then you would lose your firstborn to death. It's odd, I know, but the ancient principle at work there is vital for Jesus. On that night of the Exodus, all those centuries before, the death of the lamb was a substitute and it protected you from death. So as an Israelite, as a member of the rescued community, the community which was substituted for, Jesus should not have been saying the things he says, right? Let's look at it again. Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take it, this is my body. Well, now here's a thing. We probably rightly assume that Jesus and his disciples spoke to each other in Aramaic that night of the Last Supper. Even though I'm sure that Jesus spoke Greek and spoke it well, this conversation probably took place in Aramaic. And so we don't know the precise words which were used. Uh, Mark has recorded it for us in Greek. Soma mu, my body uses the word soma 
Very often, soma quite specifically means not just a body, but a dead body, a corpse. This is true in classical Greek as well as in the Greek of the New Testament. Even in Mark's Gospel, uh, have a look at the end at chapter 15, verse 43, if you want to track down an example. Seems likely to me that Jesus' disciples would have understood him, meaning, take it, this is my corpse. If we were allowed to celebrate communion right now, and if we were in church and you came to the front and I put the bread into your hands and said to you, the corpse of Christ, would that shock you? This is also why it is really important that Jesus used two separate elements, bread and wine, not just one. Because separate someone's blood from their body and you are certainly talking about that person's death. This is why I am very, very unhappy with the idea that when we have been able to celebrate communion in this season of coronavirus, initially I was supposed to give you the bread only, and more latterly there's been a suggestion that I could give you bread dipped in wine and not separated. And as you may know, if you've been to a service over the last year, the church wardens and I resolved to keep the symbolism as close as we could to what Jesus demonstrated. And we have given you bread and wine separated from each other in a COVID safe fashion. The body is separated from the blood. Jesus is talking about a corpse. He's talking about death. He's talking about his death. As an Israelite on Passover night, he really, really shouldn't be talking like this. But don't you see, he may be talking about his death, but he's also talking about your life. His death is the great act of God's rescue. He is the substitute. He is the lamb. His death brings you true life. Well, it's an interesting thing that even though you know this is a gospel of Jesus Christ and so he should be centre stage, if you look at this chapter, chapter 14, as a whole, there's a couple of other figures who just will not get off the stage. In the town of Bethany, at the start, Judas is cross and he goes to the chief priests to betray Jesus. Here in the Last Supper, Peter is boastful. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. At Gethsemane, Judas appears with an armed crowd and kisses Jesus to identify him, an act of betrayal. At the house of the high priest, Peter does indeed disown Jesus. I don't know this man you are talking about. Judas, Peter, Judas, Peter, always on the stage, never clearing off, representing between them the feckless, boastful, forsaking, double-crossing nature of humanity. And yet Jesus is faithful to them, to us all. He will go to his death, a Passover lamb in place of us, that we may know fully the loving, rescuing, restoring life of God. It's not the end of the story, of course, and we'll uncover the rest bit by bit over the next few weeks. But what should we do with this bit which we have read today? If I asked you what was the most repeated command of God in the Bible, 
what would you say it was? To, to love? Uh, to worship? To obey? People are often surprised to find that actually the most commonly repeated command of God in the Bible is to remember. Well, that's not very practical, they say. But it is practical because memories of the past, even if they are memories which are passed down, belong in the present too to help to form the present and to shape it. Truly to remember shapes you in the present. What I should do then is celebrate communion with you. The corpse of Christ broken for you. Do this in remembrance of him. But sadly, right now, I cannot do that. Perhaps you could take a moment now and resolve to meditate a while each day this week, specifically on the death of Jesus for you a great act of God's rescue, drawing you into his perfect life, shaping you and forming you in the present. Let's take a moment to remember. <laughs> 